two, one. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Energy in America, which we do every Tuesday, every every Wednesday, rather, every two weeks. And we have Lou Pugliarisi on the phone from EPRINC. That's the Energy Policy Research Organization in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to your show, Lou. I'm happy to be here, Jay. Great. <laughs> So uh, you sent me a thing this morning, which I really, really, that was so interesting and provocative. It's NOPEC. <laughs> You've heard of OPEC? Well, how about NOPEC? So I, I thought we ought to call the show um, NOPEC to the rescue, except that's tongue-in-cheek because it's not to the rescue at all. So first, can we, can we get a handle on what is OPEC? So, you know, in our time. First, we should start this. So OPEC is the organization exporting country. And uh, it is traditionally, although it's made up of a lot of countries like uh, Venezuela and uh, Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, or you know, the real big players in OPEC are Saudi Arabia, Iran, Kuwait, not Nigeria, not these other countries that generally are producing whatever they whatever they can they do of course go along with uh opec's kind of guidance if you like but really it's a it's an organization dominated by the big producer which is saudi arabia is, so it, is it a democratic and organization that they have votes and and parliamentary yes, procedure they votes and they agree so if you think about opec opec really came to the fore in 1973-74, about the time of the Arab oil embargo. And prior to that, oil prices were four, five dollars a barrel, maybe eight dollars a barrel. They got the price of oil up to twelve dollars a barrel. And at one time uh, during the Iranian Revolution, it then rose up again to thirty-two dollars a barrel, retreated to eighteen. And I think the when we go to the sort of Post, I guess the modern era, late 19, 19, turn of the century, oil prices then skyrocket way up, but they 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 oscillate quite a bit. But right now, they with the onset of the North American petroleum renaissance, even though we have problems in Venezuela, Lib, uh, Libya, around the world, oil prices are around two hundred fifty dollars a barrel, and they had gone at one time as high as one hundred and forty. And I would say OPEC has largely been concerned that the unconventional geology, geology or the shale space was a big threat to them. And the conventional wisdom is they tried to drive the shale out of business. Uh, some people think they just didn't want more competitors, but it, it was unsuccessful. So now they have to learn to live with the shale. And so where we had an era where we thought the long run price of oil was going to be closer to 100, it's uh, now closer, probably long run price of oil is going to be closer to 50 or 60. Yeah, and I saw something that suggested that um, that was because the U.S. was uh, not using as much oil in, in its cars because of the what, cafe standards, whatever, and because yeah, so we, you, have, we have more oil that we are, you know, Finding and um, and exporting. So yeah, maybe we could look a little bit about our trends in crude oil, our trends in consumption, and in the U.S. If we go to the first, uh, do they have the slides? Yes. Let's get. Let's go through a few of these pictures. So that's the wrong. That's the uh, last slide. We should go to the end of this pack and work backwards. I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here. This is actually a really interesting, I think. So, so I, I like to show all of North America, the U.S. and Canada together. And, and I think what you should, uh, on, on this particular slide, which is petroleum products, and if you think about, we don't really directly use crude oil. We turn it into products, right? And uh, those products are gasoline and diesel fuel and residual fuel and naphtha and lots of inputs to petrochemicals uh -huh. and i think what's interesting about this particular picture here is look you can see there's no major since 2010 our north america is a very 
stable but not growing consumer mm -hmm. of petroleum, right? Mm -hmm. And this is happening in an era where petroleum is starting to grow. So let's 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 look at the next slide for a second. Ooh. Okay, this is shows USMCA refers to the United States, Mexico, Canada. Okay. Crude oil and petroleum products net trade. And the reason I use the word net trade is we are a large continental landmass, right? And we bring in crude from around the world and then we re-export our own crude. So anybody who's interested in the question of are we uh, a net draw on the world oil market needs to answer this other question, which is, okay, what is the net number? Because we have a lot of crude oil coming into the U.S., but then we have crude oil and products going out. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this bottom here, we are now, North America, is a net exporter of 323, 320,000 barrels a day of exports, crude oil and petroleum product exports. And what that means is after U.S., Canada, and Mexico uses all the oil and products it can, it has this much left over and it sells it to the world market. So we are not a net draw on OPEC oil. That is so different than the way it was. You know, and take last... a look at that black line. You can see, take a look at that black line. You know, yeah. It was over 10 million barrels a day net, you know, and, yep. and grosser. Very... I was at a conference or a workshop at the Defense Department today, and I said, well, you might think this means the Navy doesn't have a big job anymore. But in fact, the unusual thing about this renaissance is the volume of shipping into on the United States has accelerated enormously. It hasn't decelerated in the petroleum era. That's because we are importing lots of feedstock, but then we're also exporting lots of value-added petroleum products. Uh -huh. So it's almost the opposite of what you would think. So this must so, have an effect on OPEC, because OPEC used to be, it, that, you know, all-powerful. Now it's not all-powerful anymore. Right. And so one of the interesting things is that Congress, one of the things, Con Congress doesn't care about a lot of things, but members of Congress get really nervous when the price of gasoline goes up mm -hmm. because they're worried their constituents might blame them for it. So they'll, they can do all kinds of bad things, but if the price of gasoline goes up, they actually have to pay attention to what their constituents say because they might get thrown out of office. So uh -huh. they, they think the way, and this is why I think this is a kind of, this legislation, if it weren't so serious, is somewhat uh, hilarious because many of the members supporting the NOPEC legislation, which by the way, uh, the purpose of NOPEC is not just to sue NOPEC, it's to get them to produce more oil. So we have members of Congress who oppose the Keystone Pipeline who have opposed developing more oil and gas in the United States, but now want a piece of legislation to overturn the concept of sovereign immunity, which we'll get to, and, and take OPEC to court and actually seize their assets and make them produce more oil, or punishing them for restraining oil production. Well, why, Yet, why don't you tell us the specific substantive terms of this NOPEC bill? Um, okay, so the one one the, um, a major term of it is uh, to right now if you're a country like saudi arabia or venezuela and you take a specific action with your natural resources you decide to collaborate with another country and restrain output or you just cut output to try to raise prices you cannot be sued under traditional antitrust laws because you're a nation state and you have what's called sovereign immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so this legislation seeks to break that sovereign immunity, which, by the way, also pertains to U.S. companies operating abroad as well. If they're mm -hmm. oper you know, U.S. companies who are operating in other countries, who are operating under the instruction of the Omanis or someone, they also are protected under sovereign immunity because they're just following the instructions of the country they're working. Well, let me, let me unpack that a little bit. So back in the early part of the 20th century, around the time of Teddy Roosevelt, as I remember, um, exactly, we had two exactly. major antitrust bills. 
in order to yeah. break the trusts, which were then very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, railroads and oil, for that matter, uh, in this right, country. Right. And so um, antitrust was invented there. And it was, it was, I guess it was a positive element in our legislation at the I, time. I, there, there's, there's a quite legitimate use of antitrust. And the question is, the one cutout for it has historically been sovereign immunity. You as a lawyer probably knows what that means. Mm -hmm. But basically, the provisions in U.S. and international laws you know, grant this immunity to countries. Countries do not come under the Teddy Roosevelt trust-busting laws, mm -hmm. either foreign. This is not true for foreign companies who are not state-owned or state-directed. you know, directed. So this they effort in Congress, in this NOPEC bill, is an right. attempt to apply all of that antitrust back in Teddy Roosevelt's day uh, to, right. uh, to nation states outside the exactly. United States. Exactly. Right, right. And so you could argue, so the first part of the, I, I wrote an opinion editorial piece today in Real Clear Energy that the most effective Counter OPEC strategy is to allow our oil and gas production to continue to grow. This limits their power. And uh, also, we have a lot of trade with OPEC countries, including refining assets in the US. And if we went forward with this antitrust kind of provisions, those assets would get tied up. People might quit trading with us in some of these critical areas. And it's just a too cumbersome tool. Well, let, let me, let me uh, connect that yeah. up. So this, yeah. this bill would say that OPEC could not exist because it is in violation of this new concept of uh, forget sovereignty, it's, it's antitrust on a global scale. So they, well, they it, as an organization reaching consensus on oil prices, could yeah. not do that. They could not exist. And then it, it punishes them somehow by allowing right, the United right. States to seize their Double assets in this country. Yes. So. So if you think about this, if these were independent companies, even though they're operating internationally and they were not under sovereign immunity, they were not entities owned by the government, they would not be immune. They would be subject to antitrust because getting together and restraining output is a clear violation of Sherman antitrust law. Mm -hmm. okay. So the question is, but there's a cutout for a nation state called sovereign immunity. Mm -hmm. And so the question here is, should we break that by U.S. law? But the well, it's interesting is, because we, we, as a matter of law, we cannot affect what other countries do. Um, but I suppose what this NOPEC bill is trying to do is saying, well, if you choose to uh, restrain trade of a product that is entering the United States, that is sold to the United States, we're yeah. going to punish you. We're going to apply sanctions insofar as you're trading uh, that product into the United States. Oh, yes. So we're going to have damages and seize your assets. Mm -hmm. but remember, that can go two ways. These countries can also seize U.S. assets. <laughs> and some of tat. these assets. We've seen that yes. lately. <laughs> right. And some of these assets in the U.S. are very valuable to the U.S., they're not necessarily engaged in the, in the upstream issue, but in, in refining assets. We have a lot of foreign refining facilities in the U.S. that produce a lot of oil and gas, uh, a lot of petroleum products. And they would be tied up in this legal morass. And they, are, they exist in the very same countries, at least to some extent, which are the members of OPEC. So exactly. OPEC exactly. would really have us for lunch, so to speak. Well, I just think we the the you know the as they say the juice isn't worth the squeeze. We would have we'd probably do more harm to ourselves than whatever gain we got in breaking up OPEC. And the other thing about OPEC is they don't really need to meet. What if what if the Saudis just say, well, we've decided to restrict output because it's not good for climate. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> do we have members that? of Congress say yeah. that all the time. We should not develop our offshore resources. It's not good for climate. Uh -huh. So I'm sort of struck by this notion that, okay, we can do this, but really what we're upset about is the price of oil is too high. But the way to get the price of oil lower is to produce more oil and gas. And a lot of the members supporting this 
support other legislation to restrict oil and gas production. Well, what, I, what I hear you saying, Lou, is that um, the, the progenitors of the introducers of this bill, and yeah. I want to find out who they are, um, really don't understand how global energy works, don't understand how oil works, don't understand how OPEC or the American market works, and they shouldn't be doing legislation on things they don't understand. Am I right? You would hope so, but this would not be the first time. No, no, no not <laughs> lately anyway. So yes, and the interesting thing about this bill is it has support by both Republicans and Democrats. So uh, traditionally, this legislation has been around for decades, but this time it's you know, it's passed the House, it's got a lot of sponsors in the Senate, and traditionally American presidents have said, look, we don't really like this bill, I hope we're asking you not to pass it, we'll probably veto it, it does a lot of, it's very counterproductive, but we don't know what Trump's going to do. Trump might say, well, this will be fun, I can, yeah. I can I lord this over people who don't want to do what I want to do. Yeah, you know, oh, that, it, 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 sure. We can expect so some it's fisticuffs. To understand, it's to understand the second and third order effects of this legislation if it were to pass. And that's why I showed, that's why we wanted to show some of these other slides so you can see the, you know, the net exports of the U.S., the fact that we are a major force in the world oil market. Yes, please. And so the second order effects of this legislation could be quite bad. So what have we got? Let's see, let's see some of those slides. Yeah, let's take a look at a few more. Okay, so this is very good. This is the U.S., Mexico, Canada natural gas trade balance. Once again, it's a little, you know, maybe a little strange for the audience to read, but the, the red, the black line at the end there is actually exports. You know, it's, uh, and, and, and the black line is net exports. So, the, so U.S., Mexico, Canada, a lot of gas moves across the borders, right? But some of it moves abroad in LNG and shipments, mostly LNG out of the U.S. And you can see there three, up to three, almost three billion cubic feet a day of U.S. natural gas is now being exported to the world market. Mm -hmm. and keep in mind, it wasn't that many years ago where the price of natural gas in the U.S. was $10, $12 a thousand cubic feet. And today it's only $2.50, wow. $3. Makes it a much more attractive. Feet. It's very attractive. It's, it's a, a spurring a manufacturing and petrochemical renaissance in the U.S. And it's also becoming, within a couple of years, we will be the second or third largest LNG exporter to the world. Well, you know, you've been involved in uh, efforts to export to Asia. I, I don't know how far yeah. those efforts have been realized, but strikes me that's a huge market and we may see this, this uh, export area on this chart increase dramatically going forward, no? We will, and in fact, we have a very, which I will send you, you can make it available, you can, they, your audience will be able to get it through our website within a couple of weeks, right after the Shanghai LNG conference, I'm heading to China on April 1st to 4th, mm -hmm. we will issue a report called China's Search for Blue Skies, the role of LNG. So we, we found some very, this is a really interesting paper, and uh, it, shows, it shows that the Chinese, the political imperative to clean up their local air pollution, it's not a climate issue for them, it's particulate matter, just getting rid of smog, is going to drive a very large demand for LNG. But that has a secondary US, effect well, for climate, doesn't it? It will have some benefits. It will have some benefits. Anyway, so what I, what I see happening in this chart we're looking at uh, mm -hmm. is that the, uh, the Asia component will greatly increase in, in the relatively near term, and we Absolutely. will be uh, exporting all that much more. And, and I yes. expect, you have to tell me, but I expect that the more LNG that's on the market, uh, the, the less oil has a place, displaces oil as an energy so, supply around the world. Am I right? Absolutely. So it, 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 it has a, a several roles it can play. In some parts of Asia, particularly, they still use a lot of residual fuel oil or heavy fuel oil or distillate, as you do, as you still do in Hawaii. 
and it will be it can it can replace it will replace that and in some areas it will be a backup fuel for renewables or a substitute or seasonal substitute uh, uh, for uh, to develop to hit surge capacity in certain areas it will displace coal and the most interesting thing I think in our uh, China paper coming out is the emergence of small scale LNG. Something that should be very interesting to, to, the, uh, to Hawaii. What, what is that? What is small, small scale, scale L LNG? Small scale LNG is uh, the use of it in trucks, uh, residential, you know, residential areas, LNG, what we call LNG in a box. Uh, you could think of a, your utility sector. I mean, you guys banned the use of LNG in Hawaii, but I mean, it could, it could be a you know, small scale LNG gets more efficient. You could even use it to, to, to replace the fuel, the oil in, in Hawaii. Which further marginalizes OPEC, further marginalizes yes, oil from the, from the Middle East. Yes. So I think there's several, there's a lot of forces out there. The, uh, more efficient automobiles, which are probably more efficiency in the auto, world auto fleet, much more powerful than electric vehicles. The substitution of gas and renewables for liquid fuels in the power sector, all of these are going to limit uh, the long run price in the power of oil. So, the, so what you're saying should, is that the bottom line is that we, we don't need as much oil. We don't need to, to, to find external method, methods to um, undermine the, uh, the restraint of trade that's inherent in OPEC. And so this NOPEC bill is, is of no effective consequence at all, whether it passes yeah. or not. I, I, think, I think actually the problem with the NOPEC bill is the second effect. The fact that U.S. companies would get, there would be retaliation, mm -hmm. there would be a loss of trade. In other words, there's a lot of components to what what OPEC. There's a lot of pieces to what happens in these countries, which are also members of OPEC. And we would be throwing out the baby with the bathwater instead of thinking of okay, what's a coherent counter OPEC strategy? Yeah. And the law sometimes is a clumsy instrument for doing for dealing with these kinds of issues. Well, it's interesting because OPEC and oil out of the Middle East has has formed a fundamental part of American foreign policy over the past several decades. It's been really so important yes. to us. It's driven so much. And now it's not as important. And now, I mean, whether Congress or the president realize this or not, it's, it's really not of so much consequence. So it's not I only agree. the price of oil. It's not only the price of, you know, fuel around the world or the use of fuel. It's also geopolitical arrangements and di diplomatic connections and exactly. will have to change. So, I do think, so I'm participating in a two-day workshop at the Defense Department on this very issue, which is what is our energy future over the next 20, 25 years? What does it tell us about our defense capability? What's going to happen to regional rivalries in the Middle East? What happens if we have a future in which the price of oil is not so high? Now it turns out, uh, so there's a lot of direct economic benefits to the U.S. from this, but there's also another side of this, which is the cost of renewables become more expensive. Because if petroleum is cheap, then it's more, exp the, unless the renewables become a lot, lot cheaper, they become more expensive. So what, what, do you, what do you expect the president's view of this to be? And we know that he's not all that excited about renewables to start. Uh, right. And now this may excite him, uh, this NOPEC thing, you know, even erroneously. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, uh, LNG must excite him. So where is he headed? He's Does he big, have a cogent a big, plan he's here? A big, he's a big supporter of LNG exports. He's pushed the agencies to finish the regulatory reviews quickly. And actually, the U.S. is doing a pretty good job of... Uh, evaluating these projects and getting the export license. There is a lot of debate inside the continental United States on pipeline, uh, you know, pipeline placement, and whether the U.S. should have a, a full cycle analysis when they approve an LNG project 
which means go back and measure the GHG emissions all the way up to the wellhead. Mm -hmm. So this, there's a whole bunch of kind of political and policy fights taking place. So well, let me ask you this, it just occurs to me to ask you, uh, LNG and oil, and the U.S. has, has both, right? But where, where exactly. does that go? Can we look forward to a future where there'll be more LNG and less oil, uh, you know, comparatively? So there, Will it stay the so same? Two, no, I think LNG is, um, you know, it's going to be, its applications will be more in the power sector, which traditionally is a sector that has been dominated by coal. And then in smaller uh, countries in Southeast Asia, fuel oil. So it will its main its main role will be in backing down the growth of coal and providing a substitute for fuel oil in smaller South Asian Vietnam, Myanmar, places like that. And pass and and also as a backup for intermittent renewables. So do you see the transportation whole... sector will still be dominated by liquid fuel? By what? liquid fuel, gasoline and diesel. So how will, this, how will these changes, you know, as they affect the NOPEC bill and otherwise, how will they affect um, public attention, governmental attention to renewables? Because you can't do renewables um, without public and governmental attention. Well, I mean, so the, uh, we've talked about this a lot. And I think the real one problem is, and this is what Gates talks about a lot, which is, you know, Bill Gates like, he said, you, we got to get these renewables and these alternative fuels. They have to get more competitive. The government can subsidize them. They can use feed-in tariffs. But, you know, it's like the uh, subsidy for electric vehicles in the U.S. You can take $5 billion from the upper middle class and give it to the upper class, but you can't take $50 billion. So you could take the subsidies, but at some point people don't want to keep paying those. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah. one of the issues is how do we get the long run cost of these renewables competitive? Some of them are getting competitive, but not, not all of them. Alu, you got some more uh, charts. Do you want to refer to them? And, 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 uh... Oh yeah, we can take a look at them quickly and let's see what they show here. Let's go through them. Okay, what's this one mean? This is crude oil consumption in the United States, Canada, Mexico. And uh, this actually, uh, once again, you see it's risen a bit, but the rise in, in the rise there for crude oil consumption is that doesn't include that some of this crude oil is turned into products and export, right? So that, you notice that the consumption of products was flat, but the consumption of crude oil is rising. That's because these three countries are also engaged in exporting some of that to the world oil market that we're not using domestic. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Let's see what the next one is. Oops. Okay. Is, one, is there another slide? That may be it. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, let me. Okay. Oh, here's, here's another one. Uh, natural gas. Yeah, I think the thing about natural gas consumption, once again, you can see it's risen. And it's very seasonal. So the winter time, there's a big spike. So I think that's, uh, and the U.S. is blessed with lots of uh, natural gas storage, which makes this possible. We mm -hmm. have lots of underground uh, geologic caverns that are very efficient, that allow us to efficiently store large supplies of natural gas in the non-winter seasons. You can see it moving up. You can see it. It's quite a, quite interesting. Yeah. So, but the surge in gas production is just so much ahead of, of uh, I mean, the surge in gas production is way ahead of consumption. So we have to keep, keep uh, exporting it, and that's actually why Eprink and Mexico is very important in that regard. And we just put an announcement on our website starting on April one. We will have a full time person in Mexico City. Ah, good. You know, so, Mexico issue, Mexican issues. Yeah. E Eprink, E P R I N C I mean, dot O R G. Is it? Org. Yeah, and actually, there's a lot of interesting stuff on the website been posted recently. I would encourage your audience to go to eprink.org. And 
there's a great set of uh, presentations on transportation from our transportation fuels workshop. There's a little new EPRIC in the news section, which links to a lot of uh, uh, a whole bunch of issues for, uh, or, you know, sort of oil and gas nerds, you know, the IMO, what we're doing. Uh, there's a little couple of pager that announces our new program in Mexico. We're really excited about that. Oh, that's great, Lou. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. energy is technology and technology is change. And thank yeah. goodness you and I can cover all these changes when we yeah. meet every couple of weeks. But, I, you know, I styled the, the title of the show kind of on a, on a reactive basis, uh, <laughs> NOPEC to the rescue. And I just like to get a handle <laughs> on the answer to that question. NOPEC <laughs> isn't coming to the rescue of anybody, right? No, no, no. We're going we're gonna to be able to do this without, without a legal. <laughs> we have to educate Congress. That's what we have to do. <laughs> big job. It's a big job, Jay. You need to spend more time. <laughs> well, we, maybe some of those, maybe all of the huge field of candidates would be watching this program and learning more about it, or at least looking uh, at I your website. I, I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> Say again? I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> Lou Pugliarisi, Epring, joining us from Washington, D.C. Always enjoy these discussions. Thank you so much, okay, Lou. Right. Thank you, Jake. Aloha. Aloha.